Penrith's son, Thomas Lindsay. Yeah, now now I have to live up to that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, so I know everybody has probably been staring into their screens quite a bit lately over the last two months. So we're going to try to make this as interesting as possible. Uh, but it's basically uh, the Rights of Nature 101 webinars that we give, which we've been giving quite a few of, are about the, the basics about rights of nature. So basically this webinar is, is for folks who don't know anything about rights of nature, that want to come up to speed on what rights of nature is, what it means, and more importantly, perhaps, or as importantly, where it came from and why it's kind of a, a new emerging system of environmental law, why we need it, uh, where it's moving, where has it happened, uh, and in Florida, what is happening now in terms of people taking those rights of nature concepts and, and trying to drive them into law. So um, um, I'm gonna watch the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So if people have questions as we move through the webinar, uh, just type them in and I'll see them as we're going and hopefully can answer them as we, as we get to them. Uh, and then we'll have a significant amount of time uh, at the end to do question and answer and some discussion stuff. So I want to start today with, with basically the big picture 30,000 uh, foot stuff, which is that we have in the United States, uh, at least, and in most of the English speaking countries, we have something called a Western system of law, a European system of law. So even though the legal system of the United States is based on the English system of law, it doesn't really matter whether it's English system of law or Dutch or Portuguese or Spanish, basically all the colonizing countries uh, that had colonies uh, exported a certain system of law to those colonies. And in the US, we were the receiver of an English system of law. And no matter which system of law you look at, but including the English system of law, you're basically one of two things under that system of law. You're either a thing or you're a person under the system of law. So you're either a thing, which basically means your property under the system of law, you can be owned, or you're a person, which is essentially a rights bearing entity. So capable of, of having rights. So under these systems of law, this dualism that we talk about, this dualism system of law, uh, you're either property or you're capable of having rights. And there's been a real schism between this Western or European system of law that we have and an indigenous system of law. So indigenous communities across the world have a different idea of what nature is. So under the Western system of law, nature and ecosystems are essentially property. They are things under the law. They're not capable of having rights. They're capable of being owned and they're capable in some ways of being protected, regulated, but they're not capable of having rights. So when we draw that distinction, when we're giving talks, we sometimes talk about slaves in the 1840s. Slaves were things in the 1840s. If you killed a slave, there was no crime of homicide or murder for a slave because a slave was a thing. You couldn't murder the slave. Uh, the, the, uh, the remedy for your killing of the slave was to pay property damages to the owner. So because the slave was a thing, uh, the only rights it had were, were derivative through the slave owner. And if you interfered with the use of the slave uh, for that slave owner, you owed property damage to the slave owner. We also talk a lot about women's status in the 1870s, which women were not persons. They were things under the law. They couldn't uh, contract, couldn't own property, uh, couldn't uh, become licensed to become a lawyer. Uh, and property and other things were held by their oldest male relatives. So by their husband, by their, uh, by their brother, uh, but women were things under the law. So rape was not a crime, was not a criminal offense. Uh, it was again, a property damage crime because a, a woman was a thing. So that Western system of law concept about things and persons uh, nature is a thing. So it falls into that category of an 1840s African-American slave or an 1870s woman. It's a thing under the law that has collided with the vision of indigenous communities in the, in the world, which is tribal communities, indigenous communities have a much different vision for what nature is. Nature is not property. 
nature is something living uh, to tribes and indigenous communities. So it doesn't fall into that pocket of property that we have under a Western system of law. And you see this when you're talking with indigenous communities and tribal nations, uh, which we do because many of our clients are tribal nations. Uh, but you, you see it in their language and you see it in their, in, in, in their culture for those indigenous communities, those tribal nations. So like the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma uh, talk about uh, the necessity of the tribe speaking for those without voices, i.e. the animals and the ecosystems in nature. The White Earth Nation, uh, the Chippewa uh, community in Minnesota, they talk about protecting the flying people and the swimming people. So the salmon being the swimming people and birds as being the flying people. Or the Yurok Nation in California, which uh, recently, folks may be familiar with this, recognized that the Klamath River in Northern California uh, was actually a person with certain rights. And they talk about the Klamath being a living being uh, or a relative. They talk about the river being a relative of the tribe. So this difference between the way indigenous communities see nature and the way this Western European system of law sees nature. And I think one of the best ways to characterize how our Western system of law, the one that we have, sees nature is really a quote from uh, Sir Francis Bacon. So famous philosopher from England, uh, Bacon, 1600s, 1700s. He, his famous quote was that the job of man was to quote, torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. So that was the vision of, of this Western system of law towards nature, which is uh, we need to torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets to then put those to use for humans. Um, and we see this, this concept uh, of nature as property as being a limiting factor on how we can actually protect nature. So how does that work? We, we, we won't go into detail on in this particular call, but uh, for example, the US Supreme Court has declared that if you pass an environmental regulation that takes or seizes all value of a particular piece of property, that uh, the uh, government that has passed that regulation owes the property owner money for taking that piece of property. So in other words, the environmental regulatory scheme that we have has limitations on it or constraints on it precisely placed because nature is property, because nature is subordinate, not rights bearing, that our regulatory scheme, when we adopt environmental regula regulations or environmental laws, are constrained themselves and how far they can go because nature as property is subordinated to those other kinds of rights that people have, including property rights. And therefore, there's a limit on how far those environmental regulations can actually go. So when we talk about rights of nature, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a collision between these two worldviews. The indigenous worldview in which nature is alive, nature is animate, nature is a relative, nature is a family member, that nature is, is a living thing versus a Western system of law in which nature is dead. So you have an animate view of the universe or you have a dead view of the universe. And the Western system of law, because it treats nature as property, really treats it as a dead letter. Whereas an indigenous uh, vision or, or cosmology treats nature as being a living entity or a relative, part of this web of life that we're all, you know, the phrase that we're all familiar with. So where did, where did one begin to collide with the other? Well, indigenous communities have talked about nature as being something other than property for thousands of years. Uh, it is the, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the European or Western community that uh, has not been smart enough to catch up with the indigenous uh, community's vision of nature. Uh, and that just started in the 1970s. So to get down to brass tacks, in 1972, uh, a University of Southern California law professor named Christopher Stone, Professor Christopher Stone, Professor Stone, uh, was teaching his law school class. It was an environmental law school class uh, after lunch one day on a very hot day in Southern California and his students were falling asleep. They were not paying attention. And so on a lark, he threw out this concept of trees having legal standing. Okay, I think Tom's having a connection problem. We back? Chuck, can you hear me? I hear you, Thomas. Okay. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. I think Chuck disappeared on us. 
<laughs> so, uh, so to keep going, so 1972, 1972 uh, we have uh, a situation in which a law professor, uh, basically on a lark uh, to wake up his law school class, threw out this concept of trees, forests, having legal standing in court to basically become plaintiffs. So if somebody was going to clear cut a forest, uh, Professor Stone's concept was that uh, the forest itself could become a plaintiff. So a litigant, not a human trying to stop the clear cutting from happening, but the forest itself or trees as plaintiffs in a, in a particular case. And, you know, the students got really worked up about it and they had a good conversation. And Professor Stone decided to, to, to write a law review article. Uh, about this concept. And the Law Review article was eventually titled, Should Trees Have Standing? And for folks don't, that don't know what standing is, it's basically the legal injury that you need to get into court. So courts are only open to folks who can show injuries, people or humans that can show injury. And so when we talk about legal standing, we're talking about the threshold that you need to actually get into the courthouse doors. And what Professor Stone was saying was that uh, instead of people having to show that injury, that the forest or trees should be able to show that injury as a plaintiff. The reason why Christopher Stone's piece was important was because it got picked up by the US Supreme Court in a dissenting opinion in a case today and then known as Sierra Club versus Morton. And what was the case? Well, the case was that the Walt Disney Company wanted to build a huge ski resort in what is now Sequoia National Forest and this in the 70s. And the ski resort was uh, destined or planned to have 1.7 million annual visitors, be able to accommodate 20,000 skiers and be bigger than Disneyland. So a huge development in the Mineral King Valley and in California, just so you can picture, it's between San Francisco and Los Angeles and then over on the Eastern part of the state in the Sierra Nevada mountains. So Walt Disney Corporation had this big plan for a huge resort and the Sierra Club wanted to stop it. So the Sierra Club sued. And when they sued, they were challenged on the lawsuit by the, uh, the, by the federal government, which was the defendant, by saying that the Sierra Club didn't have standing. Uh, in other words, didn't have a legal injury because uh, they couldn't prove that they had used this area of the wilderness and therefore didn't have legal injury to actually stop the proposal from moving forward. And the lower courts dismissed the Sierra Club. So they dismissed the case. They said, Sierra Club, you don't have standing to be here. We're gonna dismiss you out of the court. And the Sierra Club appealed it to the US Supreme Court. And the US Supreme Court also ruled that the Sierra Club had no legal standing because they hadn't suffered injury and therefore couldn't be in court. So they dismissed uh, the case. The reason why anybody remembers Sierra Club versus Morton today uh, is because of a dissenting opinion that was authored by Justice William O. Douglas. So Justice Douglas, one of the members of the Supreme Court, uh, as Joshua just noticed, uh, noted that Justice Douglas was also the reviewer, I believe he was the reviewer for the Law Review Journal uh, for that particular edition or volume that was coming out. So he was familiar with the piece as he was writing the dissent, which was one of the reasons why Christopher Stone rushed it into publication was because he wanted to have an impact on that particular case. But the reason why we remember the case is this dissenting opinion by Justice Douglas. And I wanted to read two paragraphs of it. I know we're a little stretched for time, but it's good use uh, to listen to what Justice Douglas said because you don't hear this often from the US Supreme Court or from any court for that matter. And in that dissenting opinion, uh, Justice Douglas wrote, the critical question of standing would be simplified and also put neatly in focus if we fashioned a federal rule that allowed environmental issues to be litigated before federal agencies or federal courts in the name of the inanimate object about to be despoiled, defaced, or invaded by roads and bulldozers, and where injury is the subject of public outrage. Contemporary public concern for protecting nature's ecological equilibrium should lead to the conferral of standing upon environmental objects to sue for their own preservation. This suit would therefore be more properly labeled not as Sierra Club versus Morton, but as Mineral King Valley versus Morton. So in other words, the valley itself is a plaintiff uh, in court. He also wrote a uh, last paragraph, so it should be as respects valleys, alpine meadows, rivers, lakes, estuaries, beaches, ridges, groves of trees, swampland, or even air that feels the destructive pressures of modern technology and modern life. 
The river, for example, is the living symbol of all the life it sustains or nourishes. Fish, aquatic insects, otter, fish, or deer, elk, bear, and all other animals, including man, who are dependent on it or who enjoy it for its sight, its sound, or its life. The river as plaintiff speaks for the ecological unit of life that is part of it. So essentially the dissenting opinion focused exclusively on the who could bring suit. It didn't talk about necessarily rights of nature substantively, what substantive rights nature should have, but it talked about who could get into the courthouse. So basically this concept of legal standing. And after the case was decided, building on Justice Douglas's dissent, there were a couple cases actually brought in the name of animals that were affected mostly as endangered species by certain projects that were happening uh, in their area that affected their existence. And so in Florida, because we're focused on Florida today, there were two cases brought by key deer in Florida. So key deer as plaintiffs uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And uh, loggerhead turtle population in Volusia County brought a lawsuit as a plaintiff. So again, loggerhead turtle as a plaintiff uh, dealing with lighting and vehicle access on beaches that would, that would impact the loggerhead turtle population. So the, the bad news is that a lot of the cases in which those plaintiffs were animals were dismissed by the courts uh, because the Endangered Species Act envisions people bringing suits, not animals. Uh, but it, it's important to recognize that in these situations, people actually tried to pick up the thread of Sierra Club versus Morton and this dissent that happened in the 1970s. So what happened next? Well, things were pretty quiet until mid-2000s. Uh, so a lot of this stuff was lost between then and mid-2000s, 2006 to be precise, when we began working in a little place called Tamaqua Borough, which is just north of Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania uh, by about an hour and a half. It's about 7,000 people that live in the borough of Tamaqua. The parallel to uh, Florida, it would be a city. So Tamaqua would be a city, it's just called a borough in Pennsylvania. And in 2006, there was a plan from the governor of Pennsylvania to dump PCB laden dredge from the Delaware River into old mine pits in Tamaco Borough. So Tamaco Borough is a big coal mining place. A lot of coal has been ripped out and sent to other places uh, from the borough. So they had a lot of open mine pits uh, that had been left over, not capped from the mining days. And the governor of Pennsylvania decided it was a great plan for the dredge, as they were dredging the Delaware River to make it deeper for commerce, to take that dredge, that mud and the toxic contaminants that are mixed into all that stuff, including PCBs, take it out of the Delaware River and dump it into these open mine pits in the borough of Tamaqua. So the people of Tamaqua, not wanting to be a toilet for PCB dredge coming into their borough, decided to stand up and say no to this stuff coming in. And we assisted them to write a community rights ordinance that essentially banned the dredge from being brought into the borough, from being dumped in the borough. And as we're having conversations about them, with them about the rights of the community to say no to the dredge coming in, people started asking us some really tough questions about protection of the Wabash and Panther Creeks, which are two creeks that flow through the borough of Tamaqua, as well as the Little Schuylkill River, which supplies Philadelphia with drinking water. So there was a lot of concern about the health of the streams, the waterways within Tamaqua Borough. And they asked us, we were in a conversation with them, about why couldn't the river and the creeks be recognized as having rights? So specifically is the right to exist, the right to flourish, the right to evolve, the right to regenerate, the right to be restored, with an understanding that people in that community of Tamaqua could defend the, the rivers and creeks there, but only under the U.S. Uh, Clean Water Act, which is very limited about who can actually bring suit, but also what standards you're actually enforcing under that federal environmental law. And they were unhappy with both. So they wanted to expand the number of people that could do environmental protection in the borough, and they wanted to create new substantive rights for the ecosystem. So transforming the ecosystem from being property under the law, a thing, to being a rights-bearing entity under the law. That was the shift that they sought to make. And we helped them write an ordinance for that community. And the ordinance was passed by the Tamaqua Borough Council. So Tamaqua became the first place in the world back in 2006 
to recognize ecosystems as having rights, enforceable rights, and then creating a vehicle through which people in the community, the residents of the community, could actually enforce those rights on behalf of the Wabash, Panther Creeks, and Little Schoolfield River. So what was important about Tamaqua was it's, it was the first place. And the second thing that was important to understand is that they, they tinkered with two things. Number one was the, was the what, the substantive what, which is creating new rights for ecosystems, recognizing those rights. And then the who, which is who can enforce those rights. Basically the residents of the community could go into court to enforce those, act, to prohibit those activities which would violate the rights of those uh, creeks and uh, river within the borough of Tamaqua. So the Tamaqua law passes. And the next thing we get is a phone call from Ecuador. So in Ecuador, people have been elected to draft a new national constitution for the country of Ecuador. And in this very small world that we have become, the folks in Ecuador learned about what had happened in Tamaqua. They had newspaper clippings, they had internet, you know, web search uh, stories, and it was in the newspapers there as well. And they approached us about having us help them draft language to be included in the new national Ecuadorian constitution that would recognize rights of ecosystems within that national constitution. Uh, in essence, they wanted to shift from a property-based system of environmental protection to a rights-based system of environmental protection. And not to do it within a municipality or a small area, but to do it as a country. And so we made several trips down there. We met with the constitutional committees that were meeting. We helped them draft the language and we told them the stories about Tamaqua. We did some training similar to the ones that we do now through these Rights of Nature 101 uh, sessions, these webinars. And eventually the Ecuadorian constitutional delegates wrote Rights of Nature into their constitution. And then they sent it out for a referendum to the people of Ecuador. And it was overwhelmingly ratified. And of course the new constitution had in it more than just Rights of Nature, it was a bunch of other stuff, governmental structure and rights for indigenous peoples and all kinds of other things. Uh, but overwhelmingly adopted uh, within the country of Ecuador, thereby making Ecuador the first country in the world to actually shift from this property-based environmental protection system to a rights-based system of environmental protection. So the, this was all on paper, basically, until it became real through a series of enforcement actions, some we've assisted with uh, in the past in the country of Ecuador. But the first enforcement case was a case brought by the Vilcabamba River, so a river in Ecuador that was affected by a dumping of road debris into the river by a local government uh, in Ecuador. And the river itself, so it still bends our brain sometimes to think about this, but the river itself was the plaintiff. The river itself sued the local government to stop the local government from dumping road debris uh, into, the, into the Vilcabamba River. Uh, because the, uh, the cause of action was that the dumping of road debris into the river was diverting the flow of the river and changing the course. And therefore that violated the constitutional standards that were contained within the Ecuadorian constitution. So that was the first enforcement case. And as we watched it unroll, uh, the judge in that case ruled in favor of the river. So it was the first case in the world in which a judge ruled in favor of an ecosystem based on the violation of the ecosystem's rights from this prohibited activity uh, that was being done to the river. So since then in Ecuador, there's been about 60 different enforcement cases. Some have been brought by the government, some have been brought by private citizens, uh, others have made, it way, made their way into the criminal courts. Uh, the important thing to remember or to know today is that just last week, uh, the Ecuadorian uh, Constitutional Court, which is the highest court dealing with constitutional issues in the country of Ecuador, has now accepted four cases uh, dealing with the rights of nature, essentially to script out uh, very specific and ongoing standards for what violations of those rights of ecosystems will look like in Ecuador. So it's an ongoing thing, it's continuing to develop, uh, and the fact that the Constitutional Court has now taken these cases on appeal is a very important, important thing in the development of rights of nature. So as with all this kind of stuff, the Ecuadorian uh, constitution became big news. First country to adopt rights of nature in a national constitution. And it boomeranged back to the United States. 
and other municipalities began contacting us. So cities, towns, villages, counties. And the biggest municipality that contacted us about doing a rights of nature law was the city of Pittsburgh in 2010. So in the city of Pittsburgh, their bugaboo, their big enemy coming in was fracking. So hydrofracking for natural gas. And the big fracking companies had actually leased land under a Catholic cemetery in the middle of the city of Pittsburgh to frack for natural gas. And as you can imagine, that kind of lease or, or uh, setup uh, made a lot of people angry in the city of Pittsburgh. They moved forward with our help to draft a law that banned hydrofracking for natural gas within the city and also added a rights of nature provision into the law that protected the three rivers in Pittsburgh, the Ohio, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela. So within the city of Pittsburgh, wanting to protect the ecosystems by recognizing rights for those ecosystems within the city of Pittsburgh. To our surprise, uh, the city council unanimously adopted that law. It's law today in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, this rights of nature provision, uh, including the rights of nature provision protecting those rivers within uh, the city of Pittsburgh. So that's the biggest, most well-known municipality to do that work within the US. Today, there are three dozen communities in the United States uh, that have adopted rights of nature laws. And they range from the small, like a little place called Grant Township, uh, and Highland Township in Western Pennsylvania. So we're talking, you know, a thousand or less people uh, in those places that, are, that have tried to protect a spring, uh, a river, uh, and uh, have placed rights of nature provisions into their local governing laws. And then you have places like Toledo, Ohio. People may be familiar with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, which was, uh, which was um, passed within the city of Toledo by the people of Toledo as a citizens initiative, overwhelmingly adopted uh, to recognize that Lake Erie had certain rights to exist and flourish and thrive and regenerate and be restored and all those other rights. So basically big places, little places, we're gonna talk more about what's happening in Florida now, which is one of the biggest places uh, to actually begin moving rights of nature uh, legislation. Uh, but to date, three dozen communities in the United States have taken this on and basically passed these legally binding laws at the municipal level on rights of nature. So the most exciting thing I think that's happened in the last uh, four years uh, has been that courts in other countries, not the US, but in other countries, have begun to recognize rights of nature without any legislation on the ground. So in places where no laws have been passed or adopted by city councils or by national governments, courts in other countries have begun to recognize rights of nature. So in 2016, the Colombian Constitutional Court, again, the highest court in Colombia that deals with constitutional issues, uh, recognized that the Rio Atrato River within Colombia had certain rights, basically was a legal being uh, that had uh, certain rights uh, to exist and flourish and thrive and those types of things. Uh, and what was amazing is that in Colombia, nobody's passed a law to that extent. These were judges who were issuing a decision who found that the uh, law that was passed in Ecuador and the work that was happening around the globe on rights of nature had established a new emerging international norm of environmental protection, basically saying that uh, the, this new model of environmental protection in which ecosystems have rights is basically becoming a new international norm. And it had solidified enough for judges of courts in other countries who are ruling on certain cases to use rights of nature to make those decisions. So it was a big deal because it wasn't based on any legislation. It was basically judicially derived. So jurisprudence from judges who are beginning to incorporate and implement the rights of nature into these decisions. In 2017, we had a court in India uh, declare that the Ganges River was a legal person, that it was a rights-bearing entity. And in 2018, the Colombian Supreme Court ruled that the Amazon River and the Amazon River Basin were actually the subject of rights, so that they were legal persons or uh, the carrier capable of carrying rights and had rights to exist flourish, evolve, uh, all those other capacities. Uh, in Uganda, uh, just recently, the national legislature there passed the National Environmental Act, which provided recognized rights for ecosystems as well. 
And in 2019, the High Court of Bangladesh, so think Supreme Court in Bangladesh, recognized legal rights for all rivers within the country. So not just a single river, but all rivers in the country under this 2019 ruling by the High Court of Bangladesh. So all to say, judges, courts not waiting for legislation to be passed, grabbing these concepts, holding that they've become, rights of nature has become a new norm of international law to the extent that they could apply that in those countries to decide these cases and recognize that these ecosystems have certain rights. And then we're, we're gonna do two more things and then we're, we're gonna call, I'm gonna call it quits here, but the tribal nations and then moving to Florida. So not only has this work been done in legislatures, uh, Western municipal legislatures, hasn't just happened in Ecuador, hasn't just happened at the judicial level in these other countries, but tribal nations have actually also adopted and advanced rights of nature provisions in their own tribal constitutions and laws. So the Ho-Chunk tribe in Wisconsin has taken a vote to insert rights of nature provisions into their tribal constitution. The Ponca in Oklahoma have done the same. The Ojibwe, a white earth nation, which is uh, where Winona LaDuke lives, if people know Winona LaDuke's name. Uh, the Chippewa tribe uh, in Minnesota has adopted rights of nature to protect wild rice there, which is the tribe's uh, cultural crop of wild rice on the reservation. The Menominee tribe, the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin also passed rights of nature provisions uh, with our help. Uh, and we've worked with all of these tribal nations. Uh, the Yurok in Northern California, recognizing the Klamath River as a person, a legal being uh, capable of having rights. Uh, have also adopted uh, laws dealing with the Klamath River and in the process of expanding those laws now. So all that brings us back to Florida. So there's this, what I would term an international global movement towards finding a new way to protect ecosystems that basically incorporates this indigenous vision or indigenous view of nature rather than this Western or European view uh, in Florida. Uh, the, the biggest place where the rights of nature has really taken root, uh, thanks to Chuck and his team in Orange County. And in Orange County, Orange County is the 30th largest county in the United States, so it's big, fifth largest in Florida, that uh, through a series of very uh, long time span, lots of meetings, uh, the Charter Review Commission in Orange County has voted to refer a rights of nature measure to the ballot in November of 2020. So it's a rights of nature provision that recognize, uh, recognizes all waters in Orange County as having certain legally enforceable rights uh, within the county. Uh, and uh, in addition to Orange County, there are about a dozen other counties uh, being, uh, being organized around in terms of moving rights of nature laws forward in Florida. And the Florida Rights of Nature Network, which is the new statewide organization that's been formed to uh, assist and support the rollout of rights of nature laws in Florida is helping all of those places to do so. Uh, recently, of course, uh, there's been a bump in the road, which is Senate Bill 712. So as these counties and as people in these counties have begun moving on rights of nature legislation, uh, the House and the Senate uh, got together to, to write something called the Clean Waterways Act, which a lot of people see as not about clean waterways, but about something else, and inserted into that bill uh, preemption a language that would preempt all municipalities in Florida from adopting rights of nature laws. So sometimes it's hard to convince our peers and colleagues that rights of nature is real. You know, 20 years ago, it was kind of a laughable issue. But the folks on the other side of the equation, the corporations and the polluting industries and everybody else currently making money off of exploitation of ecosystems, uh, they understand that this is a very potent tool. And so they've taken steps uh, to try to preempt municipalities uh, within Florida from adopting or enforcing uh, rights of nature laws uh, in the state. And that, the, that bill was delivered to the governor two days ago. So it's sitting on his desk right now. And uh, the response to that uh, is going to be several fold, including a challenge uh, to the authority of the state to preempt uh, communities when those communities attempt to set heightened or elevated environmental standards, but basically the argument that the state is actually acting illegally and unconstitutionally to preempt uh, this type of heightened standards from being passed by these communities in Florida. 
So generally uh, in Florida, people have five options to move rights of nature laws. So ordinances can be passed. So a rights of nature ordinance can be passed either by the municipality itself, the elected officials, or by the people of the municipality. Florida is one of those places that has citizens initiative for every county and every city within the state so that people have the ability to put laws onto the ballot themselves rather than waiting for their elected officials to do so. In addition to those options, uh, people can uh, do amendments to their charters. So the Orange County law, for example, is an amendment uh, to the Orange County charter. Uh, and not only can the county put those amendments on the ballot and the Charter Review Commission can put those on the ballot within Florida, but people can also petition to place it on the ballot. So go over the heads of their elected officials uh, to put these laws into place. And so just to finish up uh, today on, on this section at least, uh, is to understand, number one, there's this international movement that's happening around rights of nature. It really comes out of a frustration with existing environmental laws. I practiced environmental law for a decade and uh, uh, enforced the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act and the permit appeals and all kinds of stuff. Uh, somebody yesterday, as we were doing one of these webinars, uh, characterized it as whack-a-mole, which is basically <laughs> you're putting out one fire when six others are starting, uh, and then you're driven to, to do another, but it's like whack-a-mole at the county fair where you're, as you hit something, it pops back up uh, tenfold. <laughs> Uh, and that Florida is now the hot spot for rights of nature work in the United States. Yeah. Uh, there are more things moving in Florida. There's a deeper understanding in some places about rights of nature than anywhere else in the U.S. right now. Uh, so Florida has very much become this hot spot about shifting from this property-based system of environmental protection to a rights-based system. Uh, and that in Florida, the great news is that uh, these, it's easier to move initiatives here than in most other places in the U.S. So uh, in cities, for example, if you decide to do an ordinance or a charter amendment, most of those come in at a 10% threshold, which means you can collect signatures equal to 10% of the registered voters within that particular locality uh, to put something on a ballot uh, and then be able to vote for it. And so there's lots of opportunities in Florida to move this work forward. Uh, the preemption stuff is looming. Uh, and will have to be taken on frontally, uh, but uh, it, is, uh, it is many steps forward in terms of what's happening in other places, and Florida in some ways is being looked to as a leader at this point for other places in the United States that are moving forward with these laws. So I'm going to close it out there and open it up for questions. If folks have questions, I haven't seen too many things coming in via chat. Uh, we are recording this meeting, so it'll be available to folks that weren't able to join us uh, join us today. Chuck, do you want to uh, say a little bit about the Orange County work before we move on? Sure. Uh, in Orange County, uh, on June 12th, the uh, Charter Review Commission transmitted the uh, Rights of Nature Charter Amendment to the Supervisor of Elections. Uh, I had a discussion with him. If this preemption bill gets signed, what's he going to do? And he said, until he gets a court order, an injunction, or a judgment, uh, that Charter Amendment is going to stay on the ballot and head to November. So that, that's where we are in Orange County. I, I, I believe that uh, once people even read the synopsis of the Charter Amendment, um, it, it's hard for me to see how, it's, how it would be defeated. But I have heard that the, the Black Hats, especially in Tallahassee, are going to put up a fight and they're going to put up a campaign uh, to, to defeat this uh, amendment. So we're, we're looking forward to, to, to taking that on. Um, I know we had some, some questions uh, uh, from other places around the state. Ellie, did you have a question? Um, no, not at this point. Okay. Uh, Claudia, did you have a question? 
I'm just wondering, given your uh, Orange County location, if you have reached out to other groups that are nearby, let's say the Florida Conservation Voters, or any other, or maybe Earth Justice. I know they, um, I mean, it would be interesting to see if they would be available to meet, just to, to see where their thoughts are. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I know that this is an incredible effort, but just wondering um, how far we can, uh, we can do outreach, right? Because at this moment, it's all about promoting our efforts. And first thing is to um, pass the initiative ballot in November. So just wondering uh, the work there. Yeah, it's uh, both groups that you mentioned, we've been in touch with uh, uh, Lindsey Cross at, at Florida Conservation Voters, um, Aliki Moncrief, who I worked with uh, closely on the Amendment 1 campaign in, in 2014. Also, Thomas and I had a conference call with Bonnie Malloy from Earth Justice. Um, there, are, there are a number of groups in the wings waiting to see what happens with this SB 712. Uh, and I, I, if, if they are not now, they will be when they read the complaint because uh, what the law says, Claudia, is that no government in the state, no local government can give a right to any person uh, having to do with the natural environment. And that is so broad and so overreaching that it, it just begs a, a legal challenge. If it goes through, for instance, uh, what is part of, not part of the natural environment? Uh, everything around us is part of the natural environment. So uh, to say that a local government cannot give a right to a person to own property uh, that is part of the natural environment uh, I'm pretty sure that the other organizations, such as the Florida Association of Counties, when they when they really look at what's being said in this bill, are are going to step forward and and uh, and help fight it. I hope. There were some uh, chat comments. Uh, was there a question in chat? And a question from Josh. Josh. Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks again for a great presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions. One. If you wouldn't mind, um, Thomas, restating the five ways in which Florida residents or people in Florida can um, push forward with rights of nature uh, initiatives, that would be really great because I only had a couple of them uh, written down. And then the other thing is, um, is there some kind of clearinghouse where we can find out the current status of the initiatives across the dozen or so municipalities in Florida that are uh, trying to pursue rights of nature? Yeah, so I'll take the first part of that and then turn it over to Chuck for the second. Um, so there are five, five, five ways to move these laws uh, in each county. So the, the first way to move them at the, and this is just at the county level, but most of this applies to the city level as well. Uh, you can move a regular law. So an ordinance is just a regular law that would be passed by elected officials. And in Florida, you can either have the county officials vote something into law as an ordinance, or the people of the county can petition, do a signature petition, and actually qualify it for the ballot. And then you can do those same two things about a charter amendment. So the county can, can put the uh, charter amendment on the ballot for people to vote on, and the people or residents of the county can also petition to get a charter amendment put on the ballot. So we didn't talk about much about charters, but charters are like constitutions for the counties. So basically you have the option either to pass a regular law or to pass a amendment to the local constitution. And then the fifth, so those are four, uh, four ways. And then the fifth way is a charter review commission. So counties in Florida at regular intervals, like six years or eight years, 
convene a charter review commission which has the power to put uh, certain initiatives of their own onto the ballot for a vote by the people. So basically, uh, so uh, ordinances, there are two ways to get them on. Amendments to the charter, two ways to get them on. And then the Charter Review Commission can take independent action to put stuff on the ballot as well. Thank you. The, the second part of your question, Josh, is there a clearinghouse? Uh, the the uh, Facebook page, Florida Rights of Nature Network, that I know you're on, is uh, largely the point that we all intersect. Um, but as far as is what's going on in each county, uh, on Thursdays at six, you're welcome to join a uh, group conference of all these different uh, groups around the state and what's going on and what problems they're having. That's kind of a, a, where, where we all, the intersection of all the different efforts. But I will say you're, you're up in uh, Duval County, Josh? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, uh, you know, our particular focus is on charter counties because charter counties can do things uh, by, by law, by constitution, they can do anything that is not prohibited by the state, uh, by general law. So the, uh, the, if it's not prohibited by general law, a charter county should be able to do it. Um, and we would, we would welcome uh, your participation uh, because we don't have anybody in Duval County working to put uh, either a charter amendment on the ballot or, or pass a local ordinance. So I invite you to, to engage with us on, uh, you know, either offline through email or uh, on the conference calls, Zoom calls, Thursdays at six. Yeah, and Josh, we just worked through Duval County as part of the review that we did of charter counties. And, and Duval, Duval has one of the easier processes to actually get ballot listings. So it would be mm -hmm. about 30,000 signatures, okay. which sounds like a lot. But at the county level, for a county that big, it's pretty good. So 30,000 signatures to qualify something for the ballot in Duval County. Yeah, and with all the uh, efforts going on right now around the St. John's River, I mean, that's such a, a big... Uh, issue that a lot of people are concerned about, the dredging in order to make room for Chinese Betamax ships or Supermax ships. So um, I think there could be some momentum, but I, I, I would want to have conversations with, you know, the Riverkeeper and stuff like that before, um, you know, diving in, so to speak. You know, we'll say this, Josh, I was just on a podcast with Lisa Reineman, the St. John's Riverkeeper, and she's very much supportive of rights of nature and uh, signed on to our, our veto request of SB 712. So you're gonna find a, a, a friendly voice there. Great, thanks for that update. I hadn't talked to her in a while, so I appreciate it. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't, um, this is Monty Aguirre. I work with International Rivers. And actually, you know, I, I work with an international organization and I'm, I'm so, I uh, you know, to be here, uh, really grateful uh, to learn so much. And what we're doing in, this is, I know you're talking about Florida, but, um, but so that you also know that in other parts of the world, we are trying to do the same you know, and uh, on learning this history is so important. And, um, and I think that um, d uh, developing a, some sort of methodology is really important, documenting that because that's gonna help the rest of the world and here as well. And, and also being able to define the terms um, when we, you know, when, when the cases are presented in, in court uh, by cultural rights, guardianship, eco, eco, what is it, eco centrism or eco biocultural rights, you know, all these terms are really important. At least this is what we, I mean, right now we have um, three tutelas, we call them, or amparos, because this is in Colombia. And, and it's also in uh, Peru, and, and we're proceeding that way. But um, but 
but but it's really important to know the terms you know which really are based on the all this philosophical discussion that is so rich thank you so much sorry for taking so much time no thank you and in fact uh, mari margill uh, who's our executive director at the center for democratic and environmental rights who i work for is working on a manual of standards you know, because people ask, well, what does flourish mean? And what is, what's the difference between thrive and flourish and regenerate and restoration and trying to develop those standards within a standardized manual. So I think all that is, is very important. Yeah, and standing, I think that's the key. That's, that's the key. And that's one of the things that we need to be able to communicate. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions for Thomas? Okay, we're at uh, 8.05. Uh, Thomas, do you want to have some closing remarks? No, yeah, just to thank everybody for carving the time out. And uh, we recorded this, so we'll send you the link to the recording. And uh, onwards, anybody who's specifically interested in pursuing something in Florida, Chuck's the guy in the Florida Rights of Nature Network. And we are a supporter and a contributor to that, to that entity. Thank you very much, Mr. Lindsay. Yes, that was a great presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank yes, you. have a good evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And this will be available. Uh, the recording will be made available. And uh, please share it with your friends who are similarly minded. Yes, sir. We're, we're in it together. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, yes. Thank you all. yes we thank are. You all for my good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for sharing and joining us.